Dr. Jeff Bachman. Thank you for joining us today. He's the Executive Vice President and Head of Oncology Practice at Defined Health. I guess to get things going, maybe you can talk about yourself and talk about Defined Health and what you guys do over there. Sure, Armin, and I want to thank you and Bionics for uh, inviting mm-hmm. me to do this. So, and of course, this is all designed to uh, hopefully uh, get people interested in the upcoming uh, webinar, whose date I am not remembering at the moment. But um, <laughs> no, uh, early November, yes. November thirteenth, I think. Um, in any event, yes. So um, my background is uh, in molecular biology, virology, PhD from Berkeley. Uh, first stint in the dark side of industry at a startup mm-hmm. biotech, working on ribozymes for cancer and infectious diseases. Then I started consulting, including consulting to define health, and then joined them more of a jack of all trades in the early days. And then as the oncology business grew and is now our largest therapeutic area, uh, took on leadership uh, of that um, and uh, have been sharing that with some of my colleagues. And what Define Health essentially does is provide kind of a bottom-up, scientifically informed commercial analyses for development stage opportunities for uh, pre-commercial biotechs, uh, most importantly and critically, but also for top 10, top 20 large biopharma companies. Mm-hmm. It's really a triangulation of scientific, clinical, and commercial issues. Questions like, you know, which program should we prioritize? Which target and indication we, should we pursue with our biologics platform? Uh, what's the best or fastest clinical development path? What should the target product profile look like? What's the competitive landscape? How is treatment evolving? What are going to be the unmet needs in which patient populations? Um, you know, things along those lines for particularly, again, for the, the smaller biotech. For large pharma, it's much more about strategy. Uh, hmm. Where should we go? What new technologies? What new disease areas? Uh, what should we pursue as the next wave of immunotherapy, for example? That's our, our topic for today. So. Right. Yeah. So as you mentioned, uh, we're focusing on immunotherapy and immuno-oncology as a whole. Um, with that, have you seen sort of a shift in the client base that Define Health receives as maybe being more towards in that direction, like the immunotherapy space? <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing because it's, it was almost like a, a 180 degree turnaround. So hmm. I, I like to cite the anecdote. So we do a lot of um, opportunity identification searches uh, for for large biopharma, where we do use databases such as you know Bionix is uh, working on. So and you know we use many of the kind of the long-standing established ones, uh, ADIS, R and D, Insight, um, right, right. Johnson Reuters, Blairfate, et cetera. So, um, but you know the value we bring to those analyses is is bringing our kind of again that triangulation of putting on the scientific, clinical, and commercial head and looking at those opportunities to help those clients think about what are, um, you know, good opportunities to in-license given their particular criteria. And I like to think back to, I want to say maybe 10 years ago, uh, we were doing this for a number of big pharma and always on the exclusion list were immunotherapies, which Hmm. at that point were really mostly some cytokines and cancer vaccines, um, some gene therapies, some viral therapies. Uh, And, you know, nowadays, uh, you know, immuno-oncology is probably 80% of our oncology practice. So that's a lot of, a lot of work. Yeah. That's on on IO, as I call it. Um, Right. Yeah, because we, there's the the two biggest platforms, I'd say, is the CAR T-cell and now checkpoint inhibitors. So I guess focusing more on the checkpoint inhibitors, would you see that's kind of like the more promising treatment? For well, IO, or are there other like alternative novel methods that are kind of in the works at the moment? Yeah, so for you know immuno oncology or or IO, Ira Melman doesn't like me to use the acronym IO. He says that's input output in Silicon Valley, but <laughs> it's a quick it's a quick shorthand, and it sounds better than immuno onc. But um, anyway, so right. it's a very diverse um, bucket. Um, you know, immuno-oncology, it's not one thing. Um, it's not even just checkpoints on the one hand, like anti-PD-1, pdl one agents, nor on the other hand, uh, just CAR-Ts. And even for CAR-Ts, you know, that's a subset of really what would be called adoptive cellular therapy, which includes uh, CAR-Ts, but also TCRs, uh, engineered NK cells. There are people working at other uh, immune cells. So that broad bucket of um, checkpoint inhibitors uh, includes, you know, any type of 
um, approach, antibody or, or otherwise, that's trying to counter those immunosuppressive targets uh, that the immune system has to keep the immune system in check and that the cancer exploits to its benefit to help create that um, immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment. So, you know, that's one big bucket. And there are, you know, next generation checkpoint targets. Um, similarly, there are um, activating targets, um, so stimulatory agonists that people are, are looking at to try and switch on the immune system. And uh, I mentioned all the variety of categories that are in adoptive cell therapy, and there are things that kind of straddle the two antibody approaches that um, you know are by specifics, like the approved Blincido that Amgen has, where you're using an antibody to redirect a T cell to a target rather than just using an antibody to that target, or rather than actually cells to that target. It's kind of a bridging approach uh, without needing to actually use cells. And then there's all sorts of small molecule immunometabolism targets. There's oncolytic viruses that in and of themselves come in many, many different flavors. Right. Um, that's just to name a few of the kind of big buckets. And of course, cancer vaccines, which as I said, were really kind of the, one of the first big areas through uh, starting even in the, in the 90s through the 2000s that to some degree gave a lot of the baggage and, and kind of fear amongst uh, biopharma about immunotherapy because so many of them fail. Still a huge uh, proportion of the uh, IO uh, pie when you do the categorization. And that includes you know, older approaches that people are still pursuing to tumor-associated antigens using peptide vaccination to much more modern and forward-looking approaches like targeting neoantigens using mm -hmm. RNA vaccines. So again, very, very diverse, eclectic uh, range of targets and therapeutic modalities that kind of are grouped under this immuno-oncology um, categorization. Right. So I suppose uh, going more into like the modern technologies, what kind of data is mandatory for like early stage development of these new, uh, these new uh, treatments and uh, delivery platforms that are coming about in order to generate interest from big pharma? For licensing? Yeah, so it's a good question. Um, you know, let's, let's start with the more general question of, you know, historically what Big Pharma was looking for uh, in an oncology agent that was early, meaning, mm -hmm. you know, mostly, you know, these would be preclinical assets with only animal model, mouse data. And it was pretty much the mantra for a long period of time, I'd say, you know, kind of the 10 years preceding the advent of immuno-oncology, modern immuno-oncology, which was really 2011 with various approvals, um, was that you would want to have good single agent activity, monotherapy activity in those animal models, um, which means ideally, you know, that you have an effect on tumor growth and mouse survival. And in an ideal world, and this still applies now, not just an effect, but you know, if you could flatline tumor mm -hmm. growth, not just change the curve and slow the growth, and if you could lead to you know full animal survival, not just 50% of the animals, then you know clearly people would would pay attention with all the usual caveats that that animal models have. You get to the to the age of uh, immuno oncology, immunotherapy, and you have you know some additional challenges. One you know, uh, you're doing your models in xenotransplant, you don't have even the mouse immune system. So right. you've got to start, you know, using syngenaic or other model systems. Also, mouse is not identical to human. There's different regulation. There are even some targets that don't exist in common between the two uh, or behave the same between the two, like CTLA-4. So that starts issuing problems. However, what we saw is that, you know, with the kind of the big rush some might say mad rush, uh, kind of from 2011 until 2016, 2017, let's say, uh, you know, with the approval of, of your boy and Updevo and Katruda, et cetera, uh, that there started to be a little bit of a loosening up. Now, you know, how or why this occurred, um, but the loosening up was kind of some either letting go or not have, being strict uh, about that need for monotherapy data, because there were a number of uh, big licensing deals around novel agents that would presumably be combined with a checkpoint inhibitor, IDO, for example, um, but others that had 
minimum, if any, single agent activity. So now that a number of these approaches have stumbled, again, most prominently uh, IDO, which is, is not dead, um, we're just learning, and I think we're going to figure out how to, how to use and apply that, but you know, many people are saying, well, we've got to go back to that previous uh, requirement of having some type of single agent uh, activity. So that's kind of come full circle again. So you want to have single agent activity, you want to have it in multiple animal models, uh, you want to show ideally regression, you want to go into, uh, you know, an extent tumor that's, you know, reasonably large and not just kind of give your agent at the same time you're implanting the tumor, you want to do it in syngenetic models, you want to show combinations of activity if you really uh, want to be have a strong story, particularly since many people ultimately are looking for a clinical path that's going after uh, either primary or acquired resistance to a checkpoint, meaning you're going to go in subsequent to failure of uh, a, a checkpoint inhibitor, use models that you know actually have resistance and you can show activity or resensitizing to the checkpoint, then you start to build up a very powerful story. No guarantee again, but it's a much stronger story. Right. So, uh, following up on that, with all the data that needs to be generated, is it better to be to say birth, uh, best in class or the first in class for a treatment? Ah, we might even add a better in class. Better in class. <laughs> first in class, better in class, best in class. Uh, it's a it's a it's a very interesting question. Um, first of all, it's predicated on the belief that there. Um, can be such things, right? So by design, right. you know, I think there's some discussion about, you know, why, first of all, are there differences between the anti-PD, I'll call them PDX agents, or PD-1, PDL one um, and if there are, why, um, and why not? So some have different uh, antibody classes, they may be the different epitopes, so behavior mm -hmm. could be different. Obviously, study design, uh, could lead to certain successes or failures. Um, affinity uh, is important. It's one argument that uh, has been used for perhaps why um, Merck's um, pembrolizumab, uh, Keytruda, uh, has you know, demonstrated uh, you know kind of the success that that it has. Um, but that remains to be said whether you know with those let's say those two leading programs now from from. Merck and, and DMS, uh, Katruda and, and Apibo, and, and now I think what do we have seven approved agents, um, but really two that are kind of dominating the space with these others kind of carving out kind of niches in, in smaller tumors. Question is one that often gets asked well, first of all, will just everyone believe these are the same, right? Will they be kind of considered commoditized such that someone would be able to get approval in a small setting? do some type of data suggest its value in those other settings, come in at a lower price, and, you know, someone would start using uh, that checkpoint as the preferred agent for, you know, market access reasons, uh, assuming that its data are comparable. I think that's a bit dicey, because clearly they they're don't appear to be comparable in, in data, but again, they're, they're not apples to oranges. So now you try to think, oh, someone come in with a, a me better follow-on anti-PDX mm. that actually is better in some way, and you could conceive of some things that could do that. I think it's easier to think of that for something like a, a CPLA-4, where both originators like BMS and others are working on kind of next generation uh, CTLA-4 right. that hopefully will rest more value that people believe is resident in hitting that target than the first generation agent your boy is showing. So, so I think what this suggests is that, you know, it's, it's kind of a case by case basis, um, you know, the historical argument in oncology would generally be that best in class becomes dominant historically because there wasn't as much competition. So once you were there and you garnered not only lots of additional approvals and built up a huge amount of entrenched data, it made it very hard for someone else to kind of come in and, and displace you. Now kind of follow on agents, particularly if they're biomarker driven or molecularly driven can come on really fast and kind of change the standard of care, right? Because they go after a, a mutation that arises from the first generation project. So it's not, again, not actually apples to apples because the next generation agent which may be a, considered a best in class is different because now it's doing some different things, right? It's hitting the mutations that arise from the first generation uh, programs. So 
you know, so again, I think it has to be a case by case. Let's look at CD 47s, right? There was just a, a, a you know, in the news with the cell and, and uh, yeah. program and with, uh, with uh, 47, but there are lots of other CD 47 programs out there. Some claim to be kind of best in class because they obviate issues with some of the safety that, that may be seen. So, you know, I think, yeah. Smart development, whether you, if you can get there first with a, the best agent, that of, of course helps. If you can get there first with a pretty darn good agent and have a reasonable lead and can build up a lot of entrenched agent, then that can, uh, a lot of entrenched data, then that can certainly help create an impediment to a follow on that may be, let's say, incrementally better. Um, clearly, if something comes along that is significantly better, a true best in class, and that's not just kind of scientifically or biologically, it has to pan out, you know, clinically, that it actually is doing something significant clinically, then, you know, you're going to have a, you know, it's a, almost a no-brainer, say almost a no-brainer that you would then become, you know, kind of the preferred agent of choice. Right. It's a very long-winded answer, I know. <laughs> no, there's definitely a lot, you know, to dissect in that area. Um, so, I says I guess like let's take a step back when we look at the, the large pharma who are building all these blockbuster drugs in immuno oncology. What are some of the issues and the obstacles that the smaller biotech companies have to go through in order to successfully bring their own immuno oncology drug to market? So that's also a really interesting question because you know for a long time many biotech or even specialty players in oncology felt that, you know, they could bring programs to market themselves, particularly if they were smaller markets, smaller tumor types, right. um, required, uh, you know, only um, sending their reps to, you know, some uh, X number of, you know, 20 or 30 major cancer centers. Um, but still, you know, biopharma, large biopharma kind of dominated and most biotechs would look to have some type of a uh, uh, an exit, a partnership or an exit of, of kind of licensing to the large pharma to kind of get the, the most bang for the buck, if not kind of selling the product or selling themselves outright. You know, now I think that for a variety of reasons, there are at least potentially even more real opportunity for many of these biotechs to um, kind of come to market on their own. One, there's just much more precedent of, of act true biotechs uh, doing that, including, for example, um, Agios, right, as, as just one, one example, recent example. Um, but, um, you know, one of the other things that kind of helps the chances of this now uh, is precision medicine, right? So if you can find a subset of patients with molecular target, you start to de-risk that program, you start to define more readily the nature of the clinical development path, you have a more straightforward uh, potential regulatory path, uh, and, you know, you can conceivably have the ability to kind of bring that forward yourself without the need for a large pharma, especially if it's, um, you know, in an area, say, again, going back to the example of Agios, that, you know, has not been so much on the major radar screen of, of pharma, uh, like going after AML, right? The other side of it is there are some therapeutic modalities that one could argue um, you know, don't necessarily benefit from large pharma because large pharma doesn't have the expertise, at least in place and historically, to provide something that the biotech couldn't kind of build up itself or teach itself. Case in point being uh, autologous cell therapies. So notwithstanding the fact of, of Novartis's great success, um, or now, you know, Gilead uh, and the acquisition of, of Kite, um, one could conceivably say that, you know, many of these smaller biotechs could bring forward these highly individualized, personalized, autologous uh, approaches themselves because pharma doesn't, you know, historically like or have, have the expertise in kind of the handling because it's as much a process as it is a, a product. Now, you know, I, I think there's there's something to that. I think there are still kind of arguments uh, uh, that may pose challenges for those um, biopharma, uh, for those biotechs that want to commercialize it because there are tremendous amounts of nuances and intricacies in manufacturing and handling, et cetera, 
uh, regulatory that, of course, pharma has great expertise in. So, um, but you know, generally it is a it is a somewhat easier now. You know, when you get to thinking about you know kind of huge markets, things with huge market opportunities, then it becomes much more daunting uh, for a, a biotech to think of bringing that all the way to the market because they just need you know a, a much more of a, a, a war chest, financial war chest to to do that. Not to say that's not doable, and we've certainly seen some tremendous both uh, funding rounds as well as IPOs, whether it's Moderna on the one hand or more recently Allergene. Um, mm. So you know. Because there is so much capital available now, at the very least, that becomes somewhat less of an impediment uh, than it has before in the past. So, so I'd say you know it's a it's you know but we still see lots of uh, lots of you know biotech partnerships occurring, um, particularly in IO and particularly early on, um, you know early deals where uh, you know companies are realizing that those have great potential in a world of I don't know what the number is now you know, over 1,200, maybe it's even 2,000 now, combination trials ongoing, you know, that takes a lot of wherewithal, smarts, not just money, but smarts to kind of navigate that and being able to partner and utilize the expertise of whether it's a Merck or a BMS or an AZ or a Roche or a Pfizer, et cetera, um, can be very, very valuable uh, to those companies. So there's still a strong rationale to, to partner those, um, those programs particularly if they're going to be in combination with the checkpoint. Right. So I, I suppose following up on that with the, the boost of these like combination therapies coming. The New York, there we go. So I, I guess we go wait for that to go away. Okay. It's okay. Right. So with, as you mentioned, the, this sort of surge of combination therapies that are coming out with, whether it's with checkpoint therapies or with others, has, has there any been any changes in like regulatory pathways? Has the FDA changed the way they start to view these clinical trials in order to kind of push these these new treatments that are combined together for approval? Well, there certainly have have been, and again, I'm no no regulatory expert, um, but you know, one has seen a number of trials and approvals really going almost from kind of a, a phase one slash two or a, or the appropriate design phase two yeah. to approval in you know relatively short period of time uh and and that's you know a major sea change so i think the fda has been very uh, enabling uh, of of you know some of these new trends in nio and and also they've been i think very enabling uh, in terms of the new more kind of complicated personalized approaches, whether it's adoptive cell therapy like CARTs, where we actually do have approvals, or potentially uh, for kind of uh, the other side, the new side of, of kind of personalized medicine uh, in cancer vaccines via yeah. kind of bioantigen approaches. So yes, I mean, and, and I think another angle has been the idea of these combination approaches where, you know, historically you would need to bring each agent and get it approved individually. And I think that's shifting a bit now where, you know, there may be the potential to kind of uh, bring some of these combination products that, you know, neither of which is approved uh, going forward. Now, again, I don't know all the, you know, the details of what would be involved from the agency standpoint in terms of, you know, um, making that credible, but uh, you know, it is certainly something that is now doable where, you know, five years ago, Certainly, ten years ago, it was really kind of inconceivable to be able to do that. Not, and then, of course, there's all the other stuff between the breakthrough therapies and the usual accelerated fast track and all that. So. True. Um, a, a little off track over here, uh, harping back onto the small biotechs. Um, so, what should these small biotechs start to focus on in order to differentiate their products from all the other competitors that they have? Well, um, whether it be so, scientifically or yeah, in so, the market. Yeah. I mean, it's somewhat, you know, uh, I won't touch on what I previously talked about, about kind of, the, let's call it the follow on agents, um, the, you know, the, the next in class or best in class. We kind of touched on that on a bit. Yeah. And I think the bar is relatively high to demonstrate that you have, you know, for example, if you had a, uh, a next generation uh, anti PD one agent and you were trying to make a case to some large pharma player that was not in the space yet mm. to say now you know license this and go up against the, the biggies 
I think you're going to have to have a pretty, pretty darn interesting and strong story to do that. However, if you've got a novel target that's not validated um, and that has, in particular, is not yet um, based some of the clouds that may overhang from stumbles in the space, so it's not an IDO, um, for example, or maybe even a CD47, but you know, it's something you know that that's very new and, and nascent. Then there's still tremendous, you know, hunger uh, amongst biopharma. Um, you know, we haven't yet seen, although there is slowing um, in our analyses and I'm sure in, in others of, of some of the, the deal making, still the amount of money, uh, and we're still talking about a fair number of deals uh, are, that are occurring in IO, particularly very early, um, is still happening with, you know, next generation, next next generation uh, adoptive cell therapies or brand new targets for antibodies that are going to modulate the immune system or other new modalities like cancer vaccines. So, you know, it really goes back to some of those earlier questions also about, you know, what the data package needs to look like, right? You just have to develop a very credible story. The earlier you are, you know, the stronger that story, you know, has to be if you're not, um, you know, in, in clinical. Uh, and I don't mean the story just from the data. Also, you have to tell a compelling story as to why this is going to be clinically meaningful and at least how you imagine it's going to fit into the world. And if it's something that's really uh, unconventional and, and interesting and different, um, you know, sometimes that can be a little more challenging to tell that story uh, and, you know, it may require even stronger um, and more diverse data to kind of convince people, uh, right? Because if something's really kind of out there, particularly if you're um, kind of a unicorn, right? If, if there, It's very rare to find a, a one-off and one's always going to be a little hesitant about a one-off. Like, why isn't anyone else pursuing this approach or, or target? Usually you'll see a couple, if not, you know, a handful or, or dozens of, of others. And then it's making the case again of, you know, how do you differentiate? Are you really a better or best in class? Uh, which if they are antibodies, for example, it, it can be, right? I mean, you may have a better epitope, you may have better affinity, you may have the right uh, class, you may have a unique uh, bispecific modality. And if it's a small molecule, clearly the, the therapeutic index there um, can be very important in terms of the, the PK, the safety, the dosing. Other aspects like that. Very true. Um, all right, I guess we could start wrapping it up. One final question would be sort of in the broad sense with this boom of immuno oncology. Should all basically big pharma companies or small biotech start to focus more on immuno oncology? Or, you know, is, is this the, the next wave that everyone should be, be focusing on? I had a conversation, a prep call for I have an upcoming, I have a lot of upcoming panels <laughs> that I'm doing uh, over the next three or four months. Uh, and I was on a prep call earlier this week for one I'll be chairing at the Licensing Executive, not Licensing Executive Society's uh, conference the next week in Boston. And, you know, uh, the point was someone made was that, you know, in some executive meeting, it was kind of, you know, can you be in immuno-oncology and you can kind of turn that around and say, you know, uh, you know, do you need to be in it? Can, can you afford to not be in it? And, you know, I think that that's the issue here is that, you know, at the very, you can't, you can, probably cannot be in it now uh, to own a checkpoint or even maybe even to control your own uh, destiny with your own checkpoint. Uh, you know, that's, probably increasingly complicated, although there's still a huge number of, of checkpoints in, in development. But uh, for those players that are not yet in IO or have kind of just dipped their toes in the water, you know, that's a little more challenging, right? Because then you're trying to spot the, the kind of the, the diamond in the rough, right? They're going to say, well, what can, what can be the next big thing that's going to, you know, either enhance checkpoint uh, activity, you know, uh, increase and deepen the, the durability and the, the responses and outcomes in those patients, or if it's going to somehow displace uh, checkpoints in some way. And, you know, that's taking on a lot of risks. Many of those are going to be very early. So those players who are kind of the have nots who don't have checkpoints, you know, have to come up with some very interesting angle, you know, are they going to pursue some patient driven biomarker approach with some novel target that will somewhat de-risk and perhaps define a smaller but give you a well-defined patient population to pursue. So, you know, there are a number of, I think, angles that can be pursued, but 
and and there may be some people who are just kind of going to say, well, we're going to just kind of sit on the, not even sit on the sidelines. We're not even going to go into the stadium, right? <laughs> we're going to pursue our expertise in what might classically be called non-IO agents, right? Kinase inhibitors, uh, particularly if there's mutations that are uh, ones going after, or we're going to pursue, um, you know, uh, classically undruggable oncogene targets that are still on everyone's radar. Um, so there's certainly plenty of places to go. And I think the other important thing to know is that, you know, IO as it exists right now and with some of the combinations not having the stellar effects that we, that many in the industry had, and academia had hoped to see, um, you know, we're in a situation where, yes, there have been major see changes and major clinical benefits for patients in selected tumor types and settings. But even in those settings, not all patients are benefiting or benefiting long term. And certainly there are many other tumor types where the number of patients that are benefiting are much less uh, or in fact, more or less non-existent. So there's still plenty of room for patients to, for people to improve the management of patients, whether that's with an IO agent or frankly, increasingly, you know, what's called a, you know, a, a classically a non-IO or what we call a non-IO agent, right? And you can see that in some of the interesting deals that have been done uh, and some of the data that have come out, for example, around combining a checkpoint inhibitor with, uh, you know, a multi-targeted kinase inhibitor hmm. um, or uh, combinations with something like a, an anti-angiogenesis drug um, or combinations with radiotherapy or combinations with chemo even. Um, so, and, and I think the, the of course, the, the nuance there is that many of those agents um, may well have some immune modulating activity uh, to the benefit of, you know, helping fight off the, the cancer. Um, but what's clear is one way or another, you know, you need to basically get a handle on the cancer probably before, you know, any immune uh, modulation can come in and kind of help further with that or, in fact, uh, you know, mop up any metastases or prevent any recurrence, which means, you know, surgical resection if you can, uh, maximal radiation if you can, um, uh, chemotherapy if you can mm -hmm. to kind of cyto-reduce that, that tumor and debulk it as much as you can. So there's still the needs. Those are still the mainstay. And, you know, right now, you know, no one sees those those type of approaches and the pharmaceutical interventions that help on that kind of going away. Now, right. you know, maybe we will get to a point at some point in the future where with early intervention of the right combination of IO agents or, or other agents, you know, we'll be able to get the immune system early on to kind of prevent that cancer from becoming, you know, a significant problem. But, you know, for right now, it looks like we're going to need IO and non IO. Sorry sure. about that. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, I think we went through all the questions. So amazing answers. Yeah. So it's a lot to think about, you know, when you think of the, the new immuno oncology space and also taking the yeah, classical yeah, yeah. approaches yeah, yeah. of, you know, as you know. The, the chemotherapies, the radiations, you know. Whichever method that you choose, we're all kind of working towards the same goal, right? Of finding the best treatment, the best cure for the cancers that we have. Yeah, and you know, we, let's let's bear in mind that we are, you know, oncology is continuing and really has always, well, not always, but has for a long time been all about combinations. So whatever those combinations are, you know, even in in cases where there's a, a, a key driver mutation, uh, you know, being able to control that with a single agent long-term is the exception. You know, something like the BCR ABL inhibitors like Gleevec in, in CML is really, you know, uh, it's a great poster child, but it's also to some degree an, an outlier, right? Because in most other cases, particularly in solid tumors, you know, you don't get that durability of response. You don't get the cures, you get resistance. Mostly you'll need other agents, other pathways start to, you know, get signaling. There's a lot of redundancy, whether it's IO agent or not. So, you know, having you know, multiple modalities and targets and approaches is almost kind of built in to this challenge that is cancer. All right. Exciting times, exciting times. Well, I want to thank you again, Dr. Jeff Bachman, for joining us today. 
answering all the questions that we have in great detail. I want to remind everybody we have a webinar coming up on November 13th, Defined Health Bionics Collaboration, presented by the very own on Dr. Jeff Bachman, who's going to speak on a little bit more about the similar topics as we heard today on immune oncology, the current space, and what are some future down the line trends that we're, we can expect. So yeah, thank you. And I'll have some slides for that. <laughs> Absolutely. We look forward right. to it. Thank you. All right, great. Thanks, Emma.